Michelle Marinkovich from the Center for Teaching and Learning. And thank you so much for coming to the first in our spring quarter talks on award-winning teachers on teaching. I hope you've noticed that we will have the other talk one week from today, and that will feature Professor Chris Chidsey of the Chemistry Department. And Chris is doing some interesting things in innovative approaches to introductory science teaching. But now it's my pleasure and honor to be introducing Scott Sagan, who's a professor of political science, co-director of the Center for International Security and Cooperation, and senior fellow at the Institute for International Studies. He's going to talk to us today on stimulation and simulations, getting students interested in international relations. And Scott actually chose this topic late last summer when he agreed to speak in the series, but it seems as though recent events have emphasized more than any of us would have ever wanted just how important this subject is. Scott graduated from Oberlin College in 1977 with high honors and a bachelor's in government. He went on to Harvard University where he completed a PhD in political science in 1983 and where his doctoral dissertation on deterrent deterrence theory won the prize for the best doctoral dissertation in IR, law, or politics. As a new PhD, he then spent three years gaining practical and research experience in arms control and international security through a series of fellowships with the Harvard Avoiding Nuclear War Project, with the Nuclear Chemical Division of the Organization of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and with the Harvard Center for International Affairs. In 1986, he became a lecturer in government at Harvard, though Stanford was able to steal him away just a year later. And he has spent his career here, rising to full professor, chairing the IR program from 1995 to 1997, and serving as vice chair of political science from 1996 to 1999. His seven books, almost 30 book chapters or articles, and many, many reviews have made him an influential voice in the critical areas of international security, nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, even in weapons of mass destruction, and the prevention of war. Along the way, he has also managed to receive two of Stanford's highest teaching awards, the H&S Dean's Award and the Hoagland Prize for Undergraduate Teaching. Thanks to his distinguished efforts inside and outside the classroom, an enthusiastic next generation of international security experts and informed global citizens is being groomed here at Stanford. And so now it is my pleasure to give you Professor Scott Sagan. Nuclear weapons are in the headlines a lot these days, whether it's the good news that Libya has apparently given up its nuclear weapons program, or the very, very bad news that North Korea has now been estimated to build, have built eight nuclear weapons in the last year, or the mixed news, the ambiguous news that Saddam Hussein was invaded, but didn't have a weapons of mass destructive active program. What I'll be talking about today is a series of simulations that I've run in classes here at Stanford and through a kind grant from the Compton Foundation are now expanding the program to include other universities, Columbia, last year, Dartmouth this year, and Berkeley next year, and a major program at the American Political Science Association meeting uh, this coming August, using simulations to get students interested in international politics, and especially the politics of nuclear weapons. And a constant theme that I will have to run through this talk 
is the question of what is more real? The reality that you see here on the left or the simulation which you see on the right? Which is more real, the United Nations or the Stanford or the Berkeley or the Columbia classroom? The course in which we teach the simulation is a team taught course headed by myself but also Professor William Perry, the former Secretary of Defense, Professor in Management Sciences and Engineering, and Coit Blacker, the Director of the Stanford Institute for International Studies. It's a political science course, 114S, and a management science and engineering course. Management Science and Engineering 195, International Security in a Changing World. And you see the objectives listed on the syllabus um, in this course. But what you may not see until you get to the simulation part is that there is a heuristic and also a career uh, shaping goal involved with these simulations. And then in addition to giving the students the theory from political science mostly and the technical information from the hard sciences and the technological sides of the engineering program, we're also trying to encourage students through having a simulation of an arms control negotiation to learn more about nuclear weapons policy, not just from the United States perspective, but from other countries' perspectives. Why are they doing what they are doing? Not that you will necessarily agree with our government or with their government's position, but we're trying to encourage them to empathize with the reasoning behind this, to understand it, and also to encourage students, because this is something you will occasionally have to do in your life, is to present a position from your organization that you may personally not actually hold. How do you do that with a straight face, with credibility? And hopefully to encourage students, at least some of them, to pursue careers in public service and or foreign service. Let me start by laying out a little bit of the reality, the environment in which these nuclear arms control simulations take place by describing where we are in the world today with respect to the spread of nuclear weapons. What I have here is a chart that gives you a rough sense of where we are by having two axes, a vertical axis in which states are listed from low capability to build nuclear weapons to high capability. And then a vertical axis in which they are represented on how hard they are trying, their degree of effort from left to right and how hard they are trying to acquire, or if they have acquired them, how much they are, um, how hard they're working to maintain nuclear weapons. And you see quite a bit of good news is that there are lots of states in the international system who don't have nuclear weapons, lots who aren't trying, but also some obvious bad news. There are eight nuclear weapon states, or eight and a half, depending on whether you believe the CIA estimate that North Korea now has eight nuclear weapons. I put them right on the border. Also bad news to note that there are many states, but this is ambiguous news, I guess, many states who have the physical capability to acquire nuclear weapons relatively quickly. What I call somewhat provocatively latent nuclear weapon states, but have chosen not to do so. And however we deal with the current crisis that we're involved in today, we have to do this in a way that takes into account that however we solve this problem, there's an enormous latent problem 
right over the horizon because many other states could acquire such weapons. Why do we have so few states that have nuclear weapons given the spread of the technology and the knowledge? And certainly the birth and then in 1995 the arms control negotiation that made the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT, a permanent fixture on the international system by making this treaty last, uh, ma making it permanently extended for all members is one important part. Under that treaty, the non-nuclear states have agreed not to give nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapon states have agreed not to give nuclear weapons to the non-nuclear states. The non-nuclear weapon states agreed that they're not going to build or acquire nuclear weapons when they sign the treaty. The nuclear states therefore agree that if non-nuclear states sign the treaty, they can have nuclear power. And there will be international inspections of their power plants and their research facilities and related facilities to ensure that they are not siphoning off materials to build nuclear weapons. And the job of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is to monitor that process and verify that the non-nuclear states are indeed behaving as non-nuclear weapons states should. In addition, the nuclear states, under Article 6 of the NPT, agreed that they would work in good faith towards the eventual elimination of nuclear weapons. Despite repeated efforts by the nuclear, non-nuclear states to get a time-bound commitment about when are you really going to disarm, nuclear states refused, said we're engaging in arms control, we were working good faith, and in 1995, the United States government officially at the conference that got the uh, treaty permanently extended said, we will sign and ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And that will be the litmus test by which you will know that we are working in good faith because we will never test nuclear weapons again. The United States signed that treaty and then did not ratify it. And the current administration's position is that that's not a treaty that is in the United States' interests. And they have told the U.S. nuclear laboratories to get ready to test on a short notice. There's been no decision to actually start testing new nuclear weapons, but they have been told to get ready to test if a decision is made in the near future. Well, that has created a crisis where a number of states, I would put in the active proliferant category, North Korea, which signed an agreement in 1994 to freeze their nuclear weapons program because we had a suspected, we suspected that they were making, uh, taking out nuclear materials out of a plutonium separation complex in the Yongbyon nuclear reactor facility. And after President Bush is um, uh, his State of the Union address called North Korea one of the axis of evil, Secre Assistant Secretary of State um, Kelly confronted the North Koreans in a private negotiation meeting in October 2002 and said that we believe that you have been cheating on your agreement and that you are secretly, despite having said that you would freeze all nuclear facilities, that you secretly been trying to develop nuclear weapons by have, cutting a deal with Pakistan and importing Pakistani centrifuges to make enriched uranium. Everybody in the State Department with whom I've spoken said that when we confronted them, we assumed that they'd say, no, of course we're not doing that. But they didn't. Instead, they said, we're going to withdraw from the treaty. Indeed, you're right. We have a right to do this, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're busy with Iraq. You don't have the forces to do anything to us in North Korea. And then they began to reprocess the nuclear fuel rods, have now announced that, yes, they possess a nuclear deterrent. 
And the CIA has changed its previous estimate, saying we think they snuck out a little bit of material, maybe enough to build one to two weapons, but now they have enough to build eight nuclear weapons. Regardless of what you think about the pluses and minuses of the Iraq campaign, um, clearly an unanticipated consequence of the United States going into Iraq in the way it did was to create an opportunity and an incentive for the North Koreans to develop a capability of their own to try to deter us. On the more positive side, a new initiative announced last year, the Proliferation Security Initiative, seeks to get a coalition of the willing to join together to use intelligence, um, naval forces, and infantry forces, if necessary, to interdict any smuggling that we believe might have weapons of mass destruction involved with it. Last year, a ship on its way to Libya was stopped and boarded and was discovered to have nuclear centrifuges on it and a bomb design that had come from Pakistan. Confronted with this information, even though he had been leaning, it appears, uh, in, towards uh, giving up his secret program even earlier than this, Colonel Qaddafi announced that, you're right, we were trying to build nuclear weapons, we're going to give this up, and it's now invited American and international, American, British, and international inspectors, and has given up and has turned over those materials to us. A very positive side. More ambiguous side is what's going on in Iran, where the Iranians have had for many years a nuclear power facility that the United States feared might be used for two purposes, both to build nuclear power and to get the expertise to build nuclear weapons. More recently, it was discovered that they had secret facilities that they had not declared to the International Atomic Energy Agency. They immediately said, well, you can't let inspectors into these new facilities, but now under pressure from the United States, but especially under a more uh, cooperative effort of the British, French, and Germans, who sent senior members of their government down to negotiate with the Iranians. The Iranians said, now you can inspect. Whether they are inspecting them all, whether the Iranians have truly given up a program or not, is not yet clear. But clearly, there's more cooperation. And behind the scenes in all of this was the Pakistani scientist A.Q. Khan, the head of one of their two nuclear weapons laboratories, who we now know sold not just centrifuge technology and blueprints, but the actual blueprints of a nuclear bomb to the Libyans and the North Koreans. When U.S. intelligence presented this information to the Pakistani government. The Pakistani government immediately said, no, that's not true. After lengthy discussions, A.Q. Khan confessed and was pardoned. And the widespread belief in the United States is that the Pakistani government was deeply involved in this operation, but not wanting to admit this themselves, especially President Musharraf, our ally, Instead, they used A.Q. Khan as a political scapegoat rather than accepting the responsibility themselves. And the picture on the left is of a gory missile, which bears a striking resemblance to a North Korean missile, the, the Nodong. And it is widely believed that the Pakistani government approved at least of those portions of the sale in order to get the North Korean missile in exchange for the Pakistani nuclear weapons information. A sort of rogue state um, proliferation ring, if you will. This has led President Bush not just to declare the proliferation security initiative, but also to say that we should reform the non-proliferation treaty so that states can't resign from it, for example, or that states can't get nuclear power because they'll be cheating if they do. 
and even the head of the International Atomic Energy Agency has said that the treaty allows as all international treaties do, all member states withdraw if they feel their national security interest is gravely threatened. Um, and Dr. El Baradai, the Egyptian physicist who's the director of the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, is, uh, has, has announced that he'd like to have that changed somehow. Dr. El Baradai is actually going to be the Drell lecturer at the Center for International Security and Cooperation giving a public lecture on his efforts to try to reform the NPT um, next November. We'll get back to you, Lisa, with the date. I think it's the fourth. Uh, it's, it's the Thursday after the election. <laughs> this is the setting in which we asked Stanford students and last year asked Columbia students and Next week, we'll be asking Dartmouth students to imagine that Kofi Annan has said, given this crisis that's going on, I've asked the United Nations to put together a special negotiation to try to resolve some of the deepest problems of states feeling threatened, wanting to develop nuclear weapons. What should we do to try to reduce the likelihood of this? And we ask students to imagine that you are asked by your government to be, join that negotiation team based on students' interests, on his or her past experience, on teaching assistance evaluation of how well they do in different roles. We assign students to different countries. Sometimes we take into account special factors. For example, one year we put an uh, American of Indian descent as the head of the Pakistani delegation and an American of Pakistani descent and the head of the Indian delegation so that they would begin to understand the other side's positions. And then to understand that you should not only know about another country's position, but should understand how different bureaucracies in that country might have different positions or might have different roles to play, might have different biases. We assign them a particular role. Each one of these individuals has to do research before he or she enters into the negotiation. And in the week before the negotiation begins, students are asked to write a memorandum to the head of their delegation. So the Colonel X writes a memorandum on her position for what Pakistan should do in this upcoming negotiation to Ambassador Y, the head of the Pakistani delegation. Or the scientist from Russia writes a memorandum to the Russian head of delegation. This requires them both to do research on the facts about their country's position so that they are accurate, but also to use the theories in their imagination to understand well, what would a scientist's position on this most likely be. Why would a Air Force colonel have a somewhat, or most likely have a somewhat different view than a foreign ministry official about what is in uh, the People's Republics of China's best interest getting into this negotiation? And then they are asked, as the head of delegation, to write a memorandum to the head of state. See some students who remember doing this uh, in this room today. That head of state is played by either a professor or a diplomat. Very often we have had uh, ambassador Thomas Graham, who was actually the U.S. ambassador to that 1995 non-proliferation treaty, come here. He's going to join us in Dartmouth next week. He went to Columbia with us. We've had Bonnie Jenkins, who was one of the lawyers working for the State Department, on that and earlier arms control treaties come. Uh, we've had Ambassador James Goodby. Uh, so we bring in a, a set of ambassadors to play the different heads of states so, along with um, uh, faculty members, and a good head of delegation, both 
summarizes the substance of what his or her position will be, recommending something to the government, but also better learn what the proper way is to address the head of state. And it differs for different countries. Quite clearly, the style and the substance both are important if you want to be effective as a diplomat. Your style with your other diplomats, but also the way you play to the audiences back home. Here you see Ambassador Bobby Karate uh, playing up to Kim Il-sung uh, and Kim Jong-il, the great leader that is the father, and now our dear leader to uh, Kim Jong-il, the current head of North Korea. Sometimes students learn the hard way about playing the part. Sometimes reality and simulations can get mixed. Uh, not this past year, but two years ago, in the simulation, Saddam Hussein, played by yours truly, was told by one of his scientists that he was utterly wrong when he told the delegation that they should be tough with the United States because George a. W. Bush was bluffing when he was threatening to attack Iraq. George W. Bush, this Saddam argued, was like his father. He'd chicken out in the end. And if he did attack, it would be in a small, minor way. And they wouldn't march all the way to Baghdad. Why? Because we have weapons of mass destruction, or at least they think we have weapons of mass destruction. And the American public would never allow that many people to be killed in Iraq. And therefore, you delegations don't give up anything in the negotiations. The scientists said he thought that this was wrong. I asked him to explain his position. Saddam asked him to explain his position in our classified conference uh, room. And he explained his position that he thought th this president was going to be very different in the United States, um, that he did not think uh, the weapons we had would be as effective as, as uh, Saddam might have thought. And of course, Saddam immediately told that scientist that he was um, you know, we welcomed uh, his reactions, but that he was going to be followed for the rest of the negotiation by an Iraqi security officer to monitor every statement that he made, and that he better never make a statement that was against uh, the Iraqi leader's position. Um, I actually had to talk to both of them privately offhand, fearing that I was going to be like an uh, inadvertent Zimbardo experiment. Something was going to go wrong. I said, look, yeah, don't. Don't handcuff you. You just follow him around. I wanted to learn a lesson. He actually wrote a very good uh, exam about why he was right and why Saddam was wrong. But indeed, this ended up quite mirroring what did happen in the next year, because apparently Saddam did tell his advisors that the United States is not going to attack in 2003. And no one, because they knew what really would happen to an Iraqi scientist or diplomat who disagreed with Saddam Hussein in a meeting. No one would disagree with him. So one reason why the Iraqi military kept so many forces up in the north, for example, rather than facing in the south against the Americans when we invaded in 2003 was Saddam said the Americans are bluffing. And even though the military didn't necessarily believe that that was the case, they knew the consequences of their following their own convictions rather than doing what he told them was going to be personally very harmful to them. Students are then given by their head of state instructions based on what they have been um, discussing in the meeting before they go to Stanford for this negotiation, but also quite firm instructions. You don't, as the head of state in a negotiation, give recommendations. You give instructions, and a diplomat is told, whether they are the American diplomat or the North Korean diplomat, 
that you are to follow these instructions. If you deviate from them, you can do so only if the instructions are revised. You can explore alternatives. Indeed, there are things called non-papers, where you won't even put your name on it. You will just give it to someone, saying, here are some ideas. We want to see what your country thinks about these, and a non-answer will come back. That's true in these negotiations or in, in reality. You can hypothetically say, if my government switched its position, how would you respond? And then people are to report back. But here you see Ambassador Graham, who has just issued instructions to the North Korean um, in this uh, meeting. Um, Ambassador Graham was paying Kim Jong-il. And you see what he is telling his delegation is some of these things are things that you should do publicly, be forceful in speeches, create fear of our strength and determination, but also privately try to cut a deal with Pakistan again. That is, we'll give them a more advanced missile than the Nadan. If they support us in this and help us get nuclear weapons more quickly. Don't concede any part of our nuclear program. It's our only deterrent. We will have a plenary session after all members of these delegations have gotten their instructions. And the students present fantastic PowerPoint presentations with eloquent, albeit short, we don't have as much time as the United Nations would take with these kinds of filibuster speeches that they sometimes have. And we try to make this as realistic as possible by students being forced to dress properly. You don't show up at an international negotiation in your t-shirt and shorts. We want you to dress formally. We will have a faculty member or visiting faculty member serving as the UN representative pounding the gavel and introducing the state speakers in alphabetical order in French, which is the way it's done in the United Nations. We will have delegations do what they would really do in the United Nations setting. When the Taiwanese representative invited as a special observer to this negotiation is given the floor to speak. As you see here in the upper right, the entire Chinese delegation from Beijing gets up and walks out of the room and refuses to enter until after the Taiwanese ambassador is done with his speech. I tried to find a picture of the Iraqi scientist with his bodyguards behind him. But apparently, that was not photographed. After the plenary sessions, when all other countries, for the first time, know what their other countries' delegations are actually proposing. Yes, we should reform the NPT in this way. No, we shouldn't. We have never cheated on our agreements. Yes, you have. After that is all presented, then the students are left alone to negotiate. They are told, and they have handouts that say, here are the different rooms that you are all in. Here are the different phone numbers. And here are your emails. How do they, given that they have instructions, reach agreements, and given that their instructions are incompatible? Well, unless they were not following their orders, they would have to have some way of communicating back to their home country. And so we have created special email links. We call them classified links. They actually do have, they're just a Yahoo account. Um, state North Korea at yahoo.com. <laughs> but only the professor or visiting diplomat playing Kim Jong il has the password for that particular account. So he or she is able to find out this is what the North Korean delegation has agreed at this particular time. And I can 
he or she can communicate back to that delegation on an instantaneous or near instantaneous uh, basis. Let's see if I can. Nope. Is that the one I want, Todd? Or the middle one? Right there? Okay. So here is the Yahoo Mail account that I used last year. And since I was playing multiple heads of state, we put together folders for each one of them. And it would tell me, oh, you know, three messages have come in from Egypt, four messages have come in from Russia, six have come in from North Korea because they're really scared because they're getting beaten upon pretty badly by the United States in this negotiation. And for teaching purposes, we want to make sure that every one of these is kept in the sent file because this becomes the classified archive that students are then permitted to read when they write their exam about what happened during this negotiation. So that the head military officer for the North Korean delegation knows everything that his or her leader has now said. So to give you just one example, here is the North Korean ambassador finding out from Kim Jong-il what we should do if they, since the Russians are trying to give us more aid to sign a security guarantee with the United States. Um, Kim Jong-il, a bit of a micromanager, is telling the ambassador, you must speak first in the conference. You must issue a threat to the United States that if they engage against uh, their forces, their American bases in the entire region will be consumed by fire if North Korea is attacked. The North Korean ambassador has reported that, you see here down below, that Pakistan, who you tried to give new missile technology, says that they're not interested anymore. Well, why? Because if you know, remember in the real world that we've discovered what they were doing in the past, and now Musharraf is siding with us, and therefore they're turning off these. So Kim Jong-il is writing back, you know, this is what happens to a proud country when they let the Americans onto the soil. I liked Musharraf when he visited us and knew that he was brave. Musharraf has become a lapdog to George Bush. Use this to show what happens to countries that are not free from American pressure. We will never be Iraq. We will never be a Serbia. We will never be a Pakistan. So knowing the fiery rhetoric of his leader, Ambassador Crotty, is encouraged to go in there and yeah, represent North Korea and what the president tells him. And since the president happens to be sitting in the back of the room in the simulation, he will know how well the ambassador is representing. And in often cases, there will be private communication to the head of intelligence for that delegation saying, report to me on what happened today. So I'll get his position or her position coming in. My back, great. Resume. Gotcha. Despite the excitement and the natural flow that occurs in these simulations from the real world, Sometimes the real world does need prodding. Here are a set of fake CNN reports that were put together for the simulation in Columbia University last year from Professor Tanisha Fazal's course on international security in which we announced that given that the negotiations were going moderately well, we wanted to try to ensure that they lasted and wanted to try to reflect our view about what might really occur, that maybe the North Koreans would plan a nuclear test. And so the, we passed on information to the CIA at this negotiation, the CIA representative suggesting that, and published a CNN report. Here you have Others, North Korea readies missile tests, carriers depart for Korea, China reports massive refugee influx from North Korea, new nuclear test site activity uh, ceases. 
Sometimes, however, the reality is even stranger than the simulation. In the middle of our negotiation simulation at Columbia last year, the North Korean government, in reality, this is not a fake CNN report, announced that there had been a misunderstanding that the reports that they were in the final stages of reprocessing processing their spent nuclear fuel rods were not correct. They had actually said that they had stopped just short that they were preparing to, but not that they actually had, and the Bush administration had mistranslated their reports. Whether that was a true mistranslation, whether it was deliberate ambiguity, whether they said one thing and then backtracked, it's a, uh, uh, a common practice to do such things. We never would have possibly invented something as crazy as this in the simulation because you want to try to make it realistic. But sometimes the reality is even less realistic than the simulation. To evaluate and to encourage the learning, the midterm or final, depending on when the simulation is given in a course, will entail the student writing an essay about his or her views about what happened and why it happened. Not just a description, but an explanation about what happened during this negotiation. What agreements were made? Why did others fail? How well did your state do? But why? Explain this. Don't just tell us about it. And students are encouraged to write the best essay they can, but are given alternative approaches. You can write this as the diary or the memoir explaining your experience and try to describe what happened, but then also explain what the consequences were of your, your actions. A particularly creative and highly effective one of these was a number of years ago where the head delegate of North Korea wrote her essay by making it the report that she gave back verbally to the Politburo in North Korea upon return and had alternate bold and non-bold paragraphs. The bold paragraph was the first paragraph of her speech, honoring the dear leader and telling him how everything that he had recommended or that he had instructed her to do was brilliant and worked very effectively to serve the national interest. And then the parenthetical unbold paragraph below was, what I really should have said was this and explained. But it was a wonderful portrayal of what happens in some non-democratic and some democratic countries when people can't tell their government the truth. You can write alternatively an essay for an academic journal or a public policy journal like international security or foreign affairs, making this as professional as possible, not just by having fully cited, in some cases, you know, citing these classified documents that you've gotten from your archive or a news report that came out during the simulation. Sometimes students will be creative and will make up other citations that don't really exist but are properly done like an academic uh, journal and report what happens. And sometimes they will write a set of journal, journalist articles from either an Amer American or a British, or sometimes a newspaper account from the Pakistani English press. The best essays are not just those that are creative in their style, but are accurate in their substance as well. And I'll just close by noting that students 
seek to be accurate, but sometimes understand that under the pressure of the moment, given their lack of experience, given that they've only been a diplomat for a week, they sometimes make mistakes. Sometimes, however, reality is even stranger than the simulations. A student last year was very upset afterwards because he realized that he had said some things during the negotiation, indeed publicly in front of the entire class, that he realized afterwards were inaccurate about his government's position and its governments and the facts of the matter. And I simply reminded him that Secretary Powell had earlier in front of the United States proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction program and was about to use them on a moment's notice if we did not invade. What's more real, simulations or sometimes reality? I think I'll stop there and take questions or comments. They're both faculty friends and other friends and uh, I see a number of students in the audience so I'm looking forward to comments. Maybe you can share your experience uh, here as well. Thank you. Lisa. How many years have you been doing this, and have any of your students gone on to do this kind of work where they said, yeah, it's just like the way you taught us, or not? Well, I must admit that I've done this for seven years, and none of, as talented as Stanford graduates, undergraduates are, none of them in seven years have risen to be an ambassador serving in, uh, in that position. But some have gone on into, into government work, certainly. And they have reported that this has been a, a, a useful experience, both inspiring and that they will reflect back on individual lessons that they've learned. I don't think I've gotten somebody who's actually gone to the NPT uh, conference. But I would note one, one point here um, is that Ambassador Graham, who, who did serve as the U.S. Ambassador in the 95 treaty negotiation, um, has told these students repeatedly that many times he thinks that they are as good, if not better, than a number of the diplomats that he's met in his experience. And has also said that these simulations, while not as lengthy or as detailed, they can't be, that they have the same human feeling of working under pressure, of wanting to do the best job that you possibly can, and cutting deals with enormous uncertainty about what the proper choice will be. Um, and the best delegations here, like the ones there, are the ones that have done their homework the best, in the most detail, are most creative, have the, the best relations within the delegations, and keep in touch with their capital on a very regular basis. Other question? Yes. Remind me, I'm supposed to repeat the questions. That's a, a good question. Let me see if I can try to repeat it. Uh, do, do Michelle's question was, given that they're trying to represent the reality, do they sort of mirror it, or can they come up with more creative things and sometimes solve problems that, that are, are not uh, yet solved? Uh, I think it's actually the latter, because the faculty members involved have some experience, but we don't have crystal balls. And we don't know what the Bush administration or Dr. Albardi in the IAEA or Kofi Annan in the UN will truly do in the next negotiation. We don't know for certain. We have our theories. We have our knowledge. 
we have expectations about what will happen next week in the six-party talks over the North Korean crisis. But do we have a crystal ball with no? But what we can do is guide the students into saying, here are some suggestions, here are some orders. You see how they will react. And then sometimes something unusual will come up. And I know from my work, for example, I've been occasionally inspired by seeing some dynamics here to both make some predictions, but also to make some policy recommendations. I'll give you one example. Um, the President of the United States and the head of the Atomic Energy Agency have both proposed that the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which has the three-month escape clause written in, should be reformed. You shouldn't have an escape clause. And yet, in these negotiations, the other delegations, the non-nuclear delegations, scream when you suggest something like that. They say, we signed this treaty with an escape clause saying that if we're absolutely pressured, all international treaties must have that. You're not going to unilaterally revise the treaty by declaring that this is the case and the Security Council will consider it a violation of the treaty if we follow what we originally agreed to and withdrew from the treaty and properly gave you not, uh, 90 days notice and gave you the explanations why. And therefore, I and my suggestions made me think that you know, that's probably what's going to happen in the real world if this comes up in front of the United Nations. And therefore, through Dr. Steve Stedman, who's now serving as a, a special assistant um, at the United Nations, leading their um, panel on United Nations reform and uh, the United Nations response to current international crises, I fed in some alternative suggestions other than getting rid of the es escape clause, like lengthening it, creating a longer fuse, that I think are both more practical and have a chance of not creating a crisis at the UN because I think the current U.S. position would do so. So there would be an example. Yes, here. Okay, the question, the question is, do no, do no students question the U.S. position on the non-proliferation treaty? And do none of them point out the United States has the most and that this treaty favors the United States very much? And that's why the United States wants it to continue. And the answer is yes, indeed. If this course, it's not only being taken by Americans, although Stanford students still are primarily Americans, there are lots of non-Americans taking this class. And whether you're American or non-American, you're forced to be a member of a different delegation. And yes, the Pakistani delegation, which is not a member of this treaty, does say this treaty is unequal, it is nuclear apartheid, and the only reason the Americans want this is because it gives them an extra hammer to hammer peace-loving countries in the developing world. Now, the Americans will respond as American delegations would under this government or under previous governments as well. Say, no, that's not. This treaty is a cooperative measure that we sign. It constrains us just as it constrains you. There are different rules, but we all have to follow in the rules. And those kinds of issues are, he, are hotly debated, both during these sessions where, trust me, Kim Jong-il does give that kind of position to his, his leader, and they are then privately discussed as well. And one of the goals of this simulation, again, to repeat what I said in the first slide, I'm not trying to encourage sympathy with each government's position, but rather empathy to understand why they hold that position. And there are many positions about this treaty. 
Some governments think that this is the best thing and has to be protected. Other governments think that this is a fraud or a tool of imperialism. And those arguments are vociferously made by student delegates. I think, would the students here agree with that uh, assessment? Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Uh, what, Absolutely right. Okay, well, uh, let me give you the ones that we've thought about, and maybe if you have some others, it'd be better because you've really identified one problem you have. It is a lot more exciting being the head of the American delegation than being the intelligence officer for the Indonesian delegation, who always will complain, like, no one listened to what we did. And we had these great arguments, and not just the Americans, but the Chinese, and the, even the Indians didn't listen to us. And we'll say, welcome to the real world. That's the first compensation, is that weaker countries have weaker positions that they have to play, and, and that's a good lesson to learn. To get equality within the delegations, we do two things. One is that we give special assignments. So we will say, OK, head of intelligence, I want you to follow your own guy around. Or we'll say, the um, foreign ministry representative, you've got a special job to um, work with the foreign ministry representative of this and this country. So we try to. And then lastly, we make sure that everybody, not just the head of the delegation, is given access to that full set of documents. So you know what was going behind, behind your back. And that's an important thing. But are there other suggestions you might have? Oh, that's interesting. The next question is, is it good for the goals that you, the goal that you're selling, to further develop? What are those that are most important to you, least important to you? And that gives us a, a baseline to come back and say, well, here's what you said. Um, you, you know, happy hope and don't. Do you think it's a beta now? Do you still think so? Um, the motives are softer. You know, there seems to be a lot of concern over here and not any concern over here. Is that a necessity of yours? Is that, is that maybe? Is there a concern over here? It's interesting. So it can give us a little baseline. Sure. I could see doing that. Todd, I hope you get a note on that. We could do something like that next time in the simulation. That's interesting. Last question is Jeb, and then we'll. Uh, it takes place over, depends on how much time we have in a particular um, course, but it has often taken place from a Thursday afternoon to a Saturday night. So one and a half, two and a half days. Right.
school when you're No, it, it, it is quite clear, and there are technologies that you can use, especially as we did in this last simulation where we had um, wireless communications for the, for the, within the room where students who would say, well, we can't do that because that's against the NPT. And another student could say, the NPT Article 4 actually and could be able to read it out because if you've got the internet sitting on your lap in a classroom, as you do in some auditoriums here at Stanford, you could do that. Moreover, you could then transmit that by email to the ambassador who's at the front, who is sitting there trying to put together, well, our position would be we can accept Clause 7, but not Clause 2. And then, so you can try to do that. And as long as it doesn't create excessive cutting and pasting, it will be a positive thing. Sure. Thank you, Michelle.